You quote President Dwight D. Eisenhower in your book, quote, plans are useless, but planning is essential. And you provide a thought experiment called entropy goggles. Can you describe this thought experiment? Happily, I, I do this almost every day somewhere when I'm sitting in a given room, I will, uh, well, a quick, quick comment about that quote, actually, for all the NASA planning meetings for the twin study and other missions, that was often the quote that goes put up on the wall before we'd sit down for the day to plan the mission. It was that quote, which I Plants was- are useless. <laughs> but planning essential, which I thought was hilarious for an official NASA meeting, yeah. but it was because you need to have a plan, but you have to know that plan might change. And so I think, uh, that's just a quick context for that quote. Uh, Craig Kundro, who's a, a leader at NASA, is uh, headquarters now. I would always put that first slide up, and I'm like, "Hmm, this meeting either going to go really well or really bad. I don't know what's about to happen." But but it's an inspiring quote because it's very true. In any case, the entropy goggles is a thought experiment I detail in in my book, which is if you just sit in a room, any room, wherever you are, and and imagine what it will look like in ten years, a hundred years, five hundred years or even thousands of years, it is a wonderfully terrifying and exciting exercise. Again, it's definitely both, because you realize the transience of everything. That You think of what, what might survive. Almost everything that you're looking at will probably not be there in hundreds of years. Uh, it will be at the very least degraded, or it might be changed, altered, completely different, moved. It is just, and it's th that trait, though, of humans, to just sit there and project into the future it's easily, you know, really seamlessly with whatever you're doing and previously, is is powerful because it shows the you know what can change and what should change in some cases, but also that you know left to you know its own devices, the universe would entropy would come take over and really things would decay, things would be destroyed. But the only thing really preventing, I think, some of the entropy is is really humans, these sort of sentient creatures that are aware of extinction, like ourselves. Is really one of the only forces in the universe that's counteracting the second law of thermodynamics. This entropy that's always increasing. Technically, we're actually still increasing it because we emit heat and we never have perfect capture of all of energy, but we're the only things really actively and consciously uh, you know, resisting it. Really, you could say life in general does this. Like ants do this when they build their big homes. They're rearranging the universe uh, to make a nice place for themselves and they're uh, you know, counteracting entropy. But we could actually do it in a way that would be at a large scale and for long term. So, but the entropy goggles is just a way to realize how transient everything is and just imagine everything that will decay or change in the room around you. So if anyone listening, if they're listening on a train or they're driving in their car, or wherever someone is listening right now, uh, looking around, everything can and will change. And so you, the, the, but at, then at first it's terrifying to see that, oh, oh my gosh, everything will decay and go away. But then I think it's actually liberating. I think, wait, I, I can affect this change. I, I can prevent it or I can affect it or I can improve the change that may occur all, all by itself, say naturally. Uh, and so I think it is, but is it that awareness, again, of like kind of the frailty of life, the ever uh, insistence in increase in entropy that you can address though? And I actually say the same thing to first year medical students. I teach them <laughs> genetics. I say, I point early in the course, I say, here's all these charts of how the human body decays over, over time. It just, and I call it uh, the inexorable march towards molecular oblivion, which the students uh, often find, they kind of laugh at, ah, oh, because on all the charts, they're 22 years old, but uh, older people do not laugh as much at the, the thought of molecular oblivion, but we're all marching towards it to a large degree. So this is both a great thought experiment for the environment around you, so just looking at all the objects around you, mm -hmm. that they will dissipate, they will disappear with time. But then it's also, the thing you mentioned, which is how can I affect any of the world? Like uh, you're one little creature yeah. and it's like uh, your life is kind of, you get dropped into this ocean and you make a little splash. And how do I make it so the splash lasts for uh, a little bit longer? Because yeah. it's ultimately will, uh, I, mean, I, I suppose the wave will continue indefinitely, but it'd be such a small impact that it's almost indetectable. And so how do I have that impact at all? They, I, on so many levels, I get to experience this as, as a human. Like um, I recently ha had my cold storage uh, hacked no. uh, to where it was locked, essentially. It wasn't hacked, it was locked. And so you get to lose all your data. So for example, if you lose all your data, if you lose all your online presence, your social media, your emails, if you 
Like think of all the things you could lose in a fire. There's mm. been a lot of fires in the United States. If you lose your home, yeah, and it makes you realize, wait a minute, this is exactly a nice simulation of what will happen anyway. Yeah, <laughs> eventually, uh, and that eventually comes pretty quickly. And so you, it allows you to focus on, you know, how can I actually affect? So what matters? What lasts? Um, and what brings me joy? I suppose that mm -hmm. the ultimate answer is nothing lasts. Mm -hmm. So you have to focus on the things in the moment that bring you joy and that have a positive impact on those around you. That focusing on something that's long lasting is perhaps, I don't know, it's its its complicated, right? Because like, well, it used to be foolhardy to say, I want to think, like, legacy is often what people think of as they approach the end of their life. What is my legacy? What have I done? Yeah. Even younger in life. But it used to be really foolhardy to say I could affect something that would, or people would build the building. Architects would say, I'm, I put my name on this building and there I have some sense of immortality. But that's a, it's a fleeting dream. It's not, you can't uh, reach immortality. Uh, and if you could, it would be resource, you know, taxing on everyone else if you really, if you really were. But I think it's it's okay. I mean, if, if the books for the next five hundred years, but I presume I'll be dead for the vast majority of that time. And I, I, but that is that is actually the liberating state of mortality. Is you know that you don't have forever, so it means what can you do that is the most impactful. But you can build things that you said I want to pass this on to the next generation. Again, the most obvious thing we do with this is just people have kids, but uh, you, they don't think of this as a as an intergenerational responsibility. They think of it as, well, I was at the bar one night and I met this <laughs> hot girl and then things happened. Yeah. Or, sometimes it's more planned than that, but the the there's no overarching sense of, wait, I could have something that three or four generations from now will, that someone will receive this gift that was planned for them long before they were born or gestating. And I think we have that capacity and that that, that can be a version of legacy, but it's even okay if, if no one knows exactly who started it, but that the benefit was was wrought by people, you know, again, hundreds or even thousands of years after you start, got it started. So I think this is, you know, it's something that is um, uh, only really people that are economically secure can even begin to do this, where you can say, you know, think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you need to satisfy your physical needs, all your structural needs and have shelter. And so, you know, I'm sitting from a position of great privilege to be able to, to pontificate about what I hope I could do for things for people that come 200 years from now. But nonetheless, more and more people can do that. Uh, Humanity has never been in a better state quantifiably to be able to start to think about these intergenerational responsibilities. Yeah, this is an interesting balance because like, it seems that if you let the ego flare up a little bit, that's good for productivity. Yeah. Like saying I can somehow achieve immortality if what I do is going to be pretty good. Right. But then that's actually being kind of dishonest with yourself because it won't, in, in the long arc of history, won't matter right. in terms of your own ego, but it will have a small piece to play in a larger puzzle. And, and help it, people, yeah. I mean, I think people many generations from now. And that they said, there are all these people who were looking after me before I was ever born. I think um, it, it's, because it's a bit of just, uh, even just know, what if, when you go to a campsite, there's a camping rule that you always leave the campsite better than you found it. So if, if the fire pit was somewhat damaged and you got there, you fix it. If there was no wood, you leave a few bits of logs for the next person who comes. Yeah. And this ethos is something that uh, just picked up from camping. And so I think if we did that as people, the world would be a better place and the world coming ahead would also be. That said, with these entropy glasses, how can you uh, see through the fog? 500 years is a long time. First of all, why 500 years? Most people, this is so refreshing because most colleagues and friends I talk to are don't have the guts to think even like 10 years out. <laughs> they start doing wishy-washy kind of uh, statements about, well, you don't know. But it's so refreshing to say, all right, I know there's so many trajectories that this world can take, but I'm going to pick a few and and think through them it's and good. think what it, it's the, well, it's the quote, right? Plans are useless, but planning is essential. essential. So what? why 500 years? So 500 was a little bit of what I felt like I could see clearly through the entropy goggles. I, I feel like I can't, I can't <laughs> Which is see. Just a contradiction in terms, yes. Right, right, right. I can see. I mean, for example, if you said, uh, Chris, what's going to happen in a million years? Well, I'll start to describe 
you know, what happens to the, you know, the, the moon will be farther away because it moves several inches away every year. And so then eventually you can't have a full lunar eclipse after a while. I think about structures of uh, the continental change and things like that. I could start to describe some things, but it starts to become so you know, vague. It's just not a useful exercise. I think if it's too far out, if it's too soon, that's not that much different from what people just do with the news and say, I think this is what the economy might look like over the next year or two years. Economists are notoriously not held accountable when they have really bad predictions. You can make really awful predictions and no one seems to care. You can just make another one next week. So too short is, I think, not uh, necessarily as helpful. But 500, I actually, when I was first working on the book and thinking about the title, I thought, well, do I do 1,000 or 2,000? I kept thinking about, the main idea was, if I were to pick this up 500 years from now, what would it look like? I, I changed the number. If I pick it up 1,000 years from now or 100, and I kept trying to think of what are some time frames where really large scale changes have happened. And so in some sense, you could argue that humans have been mostly the same for about three or 4,000 years. And the best example is this. You looked at some of the Homer's poems or the Greek tragedies uh, and Oedipus, for example. Like humans are really almost identical. Like we're still petty and people, you know, have affairs and people do things they shouldn't. And people, it's, it's You're saying that all those things like it's bad. <laughs> no, it's just me. You like, you read that it's, it's astounding it's and in some sense soothing that the Greek tragedies of 2,300 years ago are very relatable to what you know, happens in like in every high school, right? So like, you know, people, that's why you read them in high school. Like, oh, it's really a, a clear part of the human condition. So on that sense, some things are, are really permanent, but I want to think of, a few reasons I chose 500 is that it's a time frame where I could foresee clear development of some biotechnology that will get us to a new place, including missions to Mars that are planned that will be there and that we'd start to have settlements there on the moon and Mars. And I could see also that by that time, I think we would have enough knowledge of biology and technology and space medicine to start to prepare for an interstellar mission, to actually send people on a craft that would have a, what's called a generation ship people live and die on the same spacecraft on the way towards a destination. But I think we need that much time to actually perfect the technology and to learn enough about physiology to be able to make it uh, for that distance. And the book is kind of focused on the human story. So a, a specific slice of the possible futures. Yes. There could be sort of AI systems, there could be other technologies that kind of build up the world. So much of the world might be lived in virtual reality. Yeah, yeah. So you're not touching any of that. You're sticking to biology. We're not, you're you're touching a little bit, but fo focused on what the cells that make up the human body. How do they change? How do we design technologies to repair them? And how do we uh, protect them? And as they travel out into the cosmos. Absolutely. And it's something that is part of the duty. If, if your duty is to keep life safe, you have to consider all means to do so. And, and engineering life to save itself is, is definitely on that list. And, you know, I think we can imagine in that time frame, 500 years, that we would, you know, there, there, you know, the, there will be AI that it's, it's continually advancing. And I actually say that I'm matter agnostic towards cognition. So if your matter is carbon atoms and cells and tissues and you have cognition, bravo, good for you. If you're, uh, if you're silicon based and you're in chips and you're in AI, that's all virtual. But we reach a state of, you know, well beyond the Turing test and really clearly intelligent. Congratulations to you too. So I feel like this sense of duty is is applicable regardless of what the state of matter your cognition is based in. So I would imagine that AI platforms that are really intelligent might also get a sense of this duty. 